So the Spiritual Scientist podcast is joined today by Terry Boardman. Terry is an historian, writer, speaker, and a translator of German and Japanese. He spent 10 years actually living in Japan, which gives him a very interesting perspective. And he writes for the quarterly magazine, New View, the New View magazine, and is a writer and editor with the monthly magazine, The Present Age, both of which I highly recommend. And Terry's written two books, Mapping the Millennium, which is all really about the new world order and the elite plans in the past and looking into the future as well. And also a book about Caspar Hauser, Where Did You Come From? And uh, I've read both those books and can highly recommend them. And Terry is based in Stourbridge in the West Midlands in the UK. And Terry joins us today and we're very, I'm very excited to have you here, Terry. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here, Mick. Thank you. Great. Welcome to the Spiritual Scientist podcast. So, um, Terry, I'd like to start out. I heard you do a, an interview with Dalingpole recently on the Dalingpole podcast. And what you did there, it sounded like, was a very big overview of Steiner's worldview in a way and anthroposophy and, and how you came into that world um, and your relationship to that. And what I'd like to do today is something a little bit different and actually have a look at history itself and the way you work with history. And Steiner, as many people will know, was very critical of history and the way history was done uh, during his time. I suppose he's probably referring mostly to the way it was done academically in the academic world, uh, the way it was studied, the way it was practised. And I wanted to just get a bit of your perspective about, you know, um, how you go about doing history and why that's important maybe as well. Mm. Mm, it's a very big question. Um, uh, since I became interested in uh, history, which was about the age of eight, um, and particularly from around about yeah, 10 thereabouts, I've always been interested in what you could call the uh, the big picture approach to history. Um, I've always felt it's important to try to get a uh, a broad overview first of all to see the sort of whole the whole domain, as it were, of uh, whatever particular part of history you're looking at. Um, and as you say, he was uh, critical of uh, conventional approaches, conventional academic approaches to history, by which he, I think he particularly meant uh, a kind of chain approach to history so that, you know, G follows F and F follows E and E follows D and, and C causes D. And it's these kind of uh, chain approaches where, whereas he would say that um, if you're looking at a particular approach, the answer to finding the causes of that is not necessarily in what comes immediately before, but it may be in something that comes very far uh, before it, which might mean centuries before it. And one of the main reasons for that is that one of his main uh, missions or tasks, you could say, is to bring a karma and reincarnation, an understanding of karma and reincarnation in a Western context. And that meant that if you look at history, history is not, for him, was not, uh, for example, as it was for Karl Marx, the uh, cause and effect of abstract forces, such as uh, class conflict or historical dialecticism or something. Um, it was always the deeds of beings, if I can put it that way the deeds of beings, and in fact, the deeds of spiritual beings, which includes, of course, ourselves, because we are spiritual beings having a material experience, but also the deeds of uh, non-incarnate spiritual beings. And that human beings in history, they carry over uh, impulses, which they uh, were working with in a previous life, or previous lives into their subsequent lives. And um, this is a, a real key to, to understanding history. And that's another reason why that you can't um, solve some a historical problem only by looking at what comes immediately before it, for example. 
because you might have an individual who suddenly appears in history, or you might also have a generation, in fact, because a generation of people is a group of people who have relationships amongst themselves. Yeah? So you might have a single individual or a generation of people who have come from, as it were, reincarnated and have come into the present time, shall we say, from, let's say, a thousand years before, from a life a thousand years before, and they're bringing particular impulses from that time. Um, and this is often helps to explain why you, you some, sometimes get uh, in history uh, sudden developments, things which appear to be sudden, dramatically new developments, for example, which you can't quite trace to what has come immediately before, perhaps. So that's a very big uh, point for him, the way in which individuals, for Steiner, individuals carry over impulses from previous lives. So when, when I look at, that's one thing. The other thing is that, as I said before, I think it's important from a spiritual scientific point of view when we look at histories to understand the, the spiritual beings and their uh, activities which affect very long and broad periods of history. And so if you have that kind of overview of periods of history, then you can understand, you can begin to understand what is the, I like to use the phrase, the historical weather, so to speak. Yeah? The historical weather, which we all live within, like for example, now it's summer, summertime, so we're living in a summery weather. Well, you can also say that from the 15th century, when the, our modern period began, we have been living in a certain summer weather, but that weather is actually, from, an, from a spiritual scientific point of view, um, it's actually the revelation of the activity of a, particular, of a particular being. So if you were to, let me make that, try and make that a bit easier. That say, let's say, for example, that you're living in a, in a country uh, under the reign of a particular monarch. And let's say that this monarch is um, a very powerful, very powerfully acting monarch. And that he or she projects his or her will throughout the country in various ways. So in these various ways, everybody within that country will be more or less affected by the will of that monarch, just as we are more, more or less affected by the weather. And you can choose to go against the weather, you can choose to go outside and not carry an umbrella if it's raining, but you can get wet, obviously. And you can choose to go against the weather of a prevailing epoch of history. But if you do, then again, you have to be prepared for, for serious problems. So there are certain spiritual beings which are active over long periods of history. And we could maybe talk about what those are in a minute. But if we understand those, first of all, the characteristics of those spiritual beings and of those long periods of history, then we can understand this weather in which we are living, so to speak, and in which then these reincarnating human beings are bringing their own individual impulses into. So history is really uh, an attempt to understand the motives and impulses of spiritual beings, whether these are mighty uh, spiritual beings at levels of consciousness far above human, the human level, or whether they are um, impulses of human beings which they carry over from previous lives. So these are the things one has to, I think, understand if you're trying to understand the particular historical um, phenomenon. Perhaps I should just stop there at the moment, see if there's something you want to come back on. And yeah, sure. No, that's, yeah. no, I think that's a really great, great uh, introduction to it. So when we're talking about um, particular spiritual beings, which in a sense mm. are maybe the ruling guides or the ruling spirits of a particular time, you know, we have this word, zeitgeist which probably yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't doesn't fully capture it but maybe hints yeah. hints in that direction um can we get a sense of what those beings are and maybe some examples 
from throughout history of where particular beings have had particular influences? Is that something you right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yes, you mentioned zeitgeist, and um, uh, those of you of your uh, viewers who are familiar in this podcast with uh, an anthroposophical or spiritual scientific picture will know that there are three uh, three kinds of beings, three different levels of consciousness, which particularly are concerned with our human development. Um, and so they are the, 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 the levels of beings, so to speak, who are immediately above us. And everybody's familiar with the, with the traditional terms, angels and archangels. And then there's a third one above the archangels, um, to which uh, Rudolf Steiner gave the name Archai, um, which literally means like principles or principalities or beginnings. And uh, it's these beginnings uh, who are the actual zeitgeist. You know, the, the zeitgeister is plural in German, zeitgeist in singular in English, um, singular time spirit, that's the meaning of the word, time spirit. And they are the time spirits in that their activities have to do with the whole of humanity for a particular period of time. Whereas if you're looking at archangels, their uh, responsibility, so to speak, relates to particular uh, communities, human communities, very maybe very small communities or very large communities. It might be a, a company, for example, an economic organization which lasts for a couple of hundred years, uh, or it might be uh, a nation, a people. Um, and, and then you have the angels which, whose responsibility is to accompany us as individuals through our incarnations. So the archangels will be looking at or uh, taking care of supervising, as it were, uh, a particular people uh, or ethnic group. Uh, and then the, the archai, the time spirits will be looking at uh, the whole of humanity for a particular um, for a particular period of history. Huh? And the archai, the time spirits, are really working over a very long period of history, about 2160 years. And that has to do with those of you, those of your viewers who are familiar with the precession of the equinoxes, which is a astrological concept, yeah? where we, we often talk about living in the age of Pisces, the age of Aquarius, the age of Aries, and so on. Um, and so these each of these ages last for uh, 2,160 years. And that's a, um, an observable scientific fact. It has to, to do with the relationships of the sun and the earth and the moon. Um, and, and then below the archive, the time spirits are the archangels. And that in order to fulfill the particular tasks of, these, of the time spirits, then these archangels, uh, as it were, the peoples within one of these epochs will for a certain period take a specific role in history. Yeah? So we can see, to give an example of that, how... Uh, since our um, time spirit period began in the 15th century, then we, we've seen in the European context, for example, that um, you had the Portuguese people suddenly came very much to the, to the fore at the very beginning of that time. And, um, and then the Spanish people, and then the French people, and then the English people, and then the German people. And there's a, you see how different peoples come forward. And there's also the Swedish and the Dutch people in the 17th century. Yeah? So each of these peoples is guided. And um, I don't want to give the impression, of course, that they are uh, sort of, the, the, the citizens are acting like robots here or automata. But there is a sense, as I said before, that the, arch the archangels create a certain mini atmosphere for that period of time within that national or ethnic community. And then you see that this ethnic or national community um, suddenly surge forward for a particular time, whether it be militarily, politically, economically, artistically, culturally, or in whatever way, you can see how, ah yes, the 17th century, the Netherlands really um, made big moves forward in, in, in its development. Yeah? And, and the developments which that people made at that time were important 
not only for that people, but for the whole of humanity, in fact. So in that sense, the archangels who were, as it were, um, working with that particular nationality were working on behalf of the time spirits who were caring for the whole of human development in that period. Yeah? Um, yes, and then within, of course, the, uh, within the, um, the, the individual peoples, then you have the individuals themselves, again, artists, scientists, politicians, military people, whoever it is, um, who will come forward and make a signal or really important contributions within that particular people at a particular time. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting, for example, in, in the case of Britain to see how after the death of Henry Purcell in 1695, I think it was, he was the last significant English composer until when? Probably um, Holst or Gustav Holst, who was Anglo-Danish, uh, or um, uh, who else do we have in, in that period of time? Um, uh, DME, I'm just trying to think of that. Oh, Va Rafe Vaughan Williams, of course, in the early 20th century. So he had two whole centuries where almost no significant composers were coming forward from the English culture. You have to wonder why that was, because for the previous 200 years, um, there were a number of uh, important English composers, yeah? But then if you ask yourself, well, what was going on in those 200 years when no great music was being made in this country, you can see how the energies of this country were going into developing other things, such as the Industrial Revolution and the, the development of, uh, of, of England's role in the, the globalization of the world, in trade and commerce. Uh, politics and warfare and the navy and so on and so forth. Yeah? So the energies of the country were going in that direction rather than in the direction, for example, of uh, music. Mm. Okay, yeah, that gives a, a really good picture of it. So um, I don't know, would now be a good point to sort of bring it up to the present day with a couple of examples of, of how things are working at the moment, or maybe to get a, a hint of what's working at the moment with, for example, yeah. the, the conflict in the Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I heard you give a talk uh, on Friday, which was really, mm. which was really wonderful speaking about this um, East West uh, conflict that's there. There is yeah. this fundamental difference between the East and the West. And yeah. there are certain groups in the West that have certain aims yeah. and there is a, um, sort of the, the call or the opportunity for the, the middle, for example, the, the middle of Europe to sort of take on a particular role. Yes, mm. there's, could we head in that direction a little bit about the, the current situation? Surely. So uh, this is where it's really important to understand these, um, these zeitgeist uh, periods, you know, the time spirit periods of 2,160 years, because um, within each one of these periods, we see that a certain culture takes, a, a, shall I say, a kind of vanguard role on behalf of humanity for that period of time. Um, and you can see, if you go back far enough, that many different cultures have played these roles. Uh, if you go back to 10,000 years, yeah, um, you can see how this has developed. And it's since the 15th century, the, the culture, the, the cultural group, so to say, who have been um, in this play, in playing this vanguard role for humanity has been what we could call the Germanic peoples. And Germanic means in this context, not just German, but everybody who speaks Germanic languages or belongs to Germanic culture. So that's Scandinavia, the Dutch, the, the British, of course, uh, obviously the Germans, um, all these people who speak these kind of languages. And of course, back in the day, they would have, uh, before Christianity, they would have been the people who, um, recognized or, or, or had the religion uh, of Odin and the, the Nordic uh, gods, the Scandinavian gods. So it is these people since the 15th century who've really been coming to the fore and have been in, in the vanguard. And for example, the United States, uh, although you've got many peoples obviously from Europe um, and, and more recently from other parts of the world, 
uh, who have been engaged uh, in the development of the United States. And almost from the beginning, you've had, for example, the people, uh, black Africans also involved in that. But you can see that in a way, the United States has been birthed from Britain. Um, and so we have today the United States, which has taken on this role, uh, which uh, Britain began in a way, and that was really to, a very significant part of that role was to initiate uh, humankind into what you could call um, natural science and materialism, as well as the, the globalization of the world. And I don't want to suggest that only uh, the English speaking or Germanic peoples have been involved in the globalization, because we can see that the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, um, they also played a big role from the 15th century onwards in that. But particularly, I would say, uh, from the 17th century onwards, you can see how the English speaking people think, for example, of the role of the East India Company, which, or despite its name, East Indies, uh, obviously was involved in completely global trade. I mean, the Boston Tea Party in America, that was tea coming from, 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 uh, from the East. Yeah. So the East India Company was a, a company which truly had a global uh, span, a glo global interests. And um, the, uh, these, these, um, uh, the, the English speaking Germanic, pe Germanic peoples have had, this has been one very important role of theirs, natural science and materialism and globalization. So that's really to help the humanity to incarnate very, very deeply into this physical reality uh, of the world. But this only lasts for 2,160 years, as I said. And the next period after this, uh, which will begin in the fourth millennium, so from about the year 3,500 onwards, um, that period will be the... Uh, that the, the, the peoples who will take the, the vanguard role, as it were, at that time, will not be the Germanic peoples in the normal run of things. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But they will be the Eastern European peoples, not the Northern Nordic Germanic or Middle European peoples, but the Eastern European peoples, the Slavic peoples, including, of course, the Russians. Um, these people will uh, develop a, a tremendous capacity, well, they already are, but it will be far greater in the future, a tremendous capacity for human community. And they will develop forms of community which we can now hardly even imagine. Yeah? Um, and the struggle in Ukraine has to do with the fact that there are certain power circles within the, the present epoch, uh, since the 15th century, that, that is the, the Germanic epoch. Um, and this Germanic epoch, its characteristic is not so much community building, but the development of the individual. Yeah? So the individual comes to himself or herself in this present epoch in a very strong and powerful way. Whereas the previous epoch, which is sometimes called the Greco-Roman epoch uh, in, in the Western context, yeah? Um, in that previous epoch, human beings still felt themselves very much within groups. They, st they still saw themselves as groups. They were beginning to develop their capacity to think as, as individuals, but they nevertheless felt themselves very strongly connected to groups. The Greeks, for example, felt themselves to be, they couldn't imagine themselves separate from their polis, from their city state, yeah? that they were very much a part of that background. Whereas in our time now, you have many, many people who are able to conceive of themselves as, for example, global citizens. They, they, they can just relate to themselves and the world. Maybe, they may not even be interested in their, their home nation or their, their, their ethnicity, their race, their, their people or whatever, their tribe. They, they, they focus on developing themselves as individuals. The problem with that is that it can lead, obviously, to self-centeredness and to... Um, selfishness yeah? um, the challenge for us in this time is to bring our individuality to a point where we can put our thinking 
and our will actions at the service of others. So to come through our newfound sense of individuality, but to put it at the beginning, at, at, the, at the, the uh, to put it at the, the beginnings of, at the service of the beginnings of a new kind of community. But we will not really be able to develop that in this epoch. It will only really come in the, in the next epoch. You can just often see the seeds of many, many people are interested in community today, new kinds of community, not community based on blood, for example, like in the old days, but new kinds of community where people share values and interests and so on, yeah? this, whatever their background. But this is only just beginning today. And so we have this problem that many of the people who are in elite positions within our present culture are carrying these impulses, as I mentioned earlier, from previous lives. And they want to continue these elite impulses into this present time. And these, because our present time is one of, of such individualism, um, they, they wish to continue an individualistic kind of dominance in this present age. And so that means that within, the, for example, the English speaking culture, that suits them very well, because the English speaking culture is a very, relatively speaking, of course, individualistic, individually oriented culture compared to, let's say, uh, Chinese, Korean or Japanese cultures. Yeah? But the Slavic peoples who are at the moment, you could say, in a kind of waiting mode, they are waiting for their historical time to come in the future where they will take over from the Germanic people. But the elites of the, of the present age are determined to prevent that. So there's in a certain, in a certain sense, our uh, current impulses of individualism, they wish these impulses to go on forever. And those impulses also include natural science and materialism. So they wish these impulses of natural science and materialism to go on forever. When I say natural science, by that, of course, I mean that they're not interested in natural science being complemented by a spiritual science. They wish science to, to remain the science of, shall we say, the five senses and what one can see through or observe through technological means, telescopes, microscopes, etc. So they are determined to block the impulses which will be coming from the Slavic peoples. And this is a sort of big picture behind the struggle which is going on between the peoples of the West, the English speaking people and the people of Eastern Europe, the Slavic peoples. And Rudolf Steiner pointed out that the future, the healthy future really depends on whether the people of Middle Europe, because they are of course the other side as it were, of the present, of the Germanic impulse of the present epoch, um, not just the English speaking, but the Germanic, the German speaking peoples yeah, of, of uh, Middle Europe, whether those peoples of Middle Europe can make a relationship to the peoples of Eastern Europe. And Steiner was emphatic that it is there that the positive impulses of the future really lie. It's quite difficult for the peoples of the West to come into a, a real fruitful um, relationship, by West I mean English speaking world, yeah, with the Slavic speaking world. Not impossible, but it's, it's rather difficult. And so you, we see continuously stress and strain between these two, as we've seen in Anglo-Russian relationships, for example, over the past 200 years. But for the, for the people of Middle Europe, um, it's really important that they come into contact and, and come to a fruitful co-working with the people of Eastern Europe. And we've seen over, over the past century, unfortunately, how the elite circles of the West have brought about two world wars in which those peoples of the Middle Europe have been turned against the peoples of Eastern Europe. So those two cultures, which should be working well for the sake of the future have actually been turned against each other in World Wars I and II. And now we are seeing in Ukraine uh, this struggle between where Ukraine is one of these Eastern European peoples and it's being used in effect as a kind of battering ram against the Russian uh, people. 
Now, to some people, it might not look like that. It might seem that Russia is being the bully and battering the Ukrainians. But of course, behind the Ukrainians uh, for the past 20 years, if not longer, has been standing the United States. And the United States is in effect using Ukraine to get at Russia. Um, maybe I should just stop there and maybe if you've got any other questions, because one could obviously say more about the, the details of this Ukrainian situation. But that's this, in a nutshell, that's sort of a big picture background to what's going on, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And I think um, there's a couple of things to, to just point out before we go on, and that is um, in no way are you saying, well, Putin's a, a, uh, Putin's a real great guy and uh, or, or the or the the evil demon yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. the ukraine are saintly and or anything like that there's no yeah. sort of value judgment being made there because the mainstream media seems to um, give us a very one-sided picture you know russia bad guy ukraine good guy and that's sort of the end of, of the story yeah um but also it's not really it's not the case that um putin is a saint of any kind so that yeah, we, exactly. i just i yeah. just want to make it clear that that's not what you're Putting across, we're looking at the the big picture, the impulses yeah. that are behind the conflict, yeah. as it were, you know, in a in a very broad sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then so I suppose a question I have uh, at that point is to look at well, wh where is it where is it headed, and what's what are the options that human beings have in this situation? You know, I mean, is, is it something that we just have to give ourselves up to and let Putin do whatever he's doing and let the US continue to use the Ukraine for their own purposes? You know, I've, mm. I've seen that the, what NATO seems to have done is to build, build up, uh, it's almost like it's surrounded the, the, Russian, um, the Russian borders over the last, mm. um, I don't know, 20 years or so. And it yeah. looks like the they've been planning something all this time and Russia's obviously felt threatened and felt, yeah. uh, decided to act at some point. But yeah, yeah I guess um, what I'd like to know is, you know, where is it at right at this minute? And, and I know that you keep an eye on the news every day and see what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then what, where are we headed in the future? I suppose that's my concern is, you know, if um, trying to get involved or, I think Steiner actually warned that what we must avoid at all costs is, is a war between America and China. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm wondering if you think that's, that, that sort of scenario is likely. Yeah, if we can explore that a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these are all immense uh, issues, Mick, as you're implying here, immense issues. And um, we certainly are living in an, I, I've long felt, in an absolutely critical uh, century. Um, those of your, your viewers who are familiar with um, the uh, anthroposophical, spiritual, scientific picture of the development of the human being will know that um, approximately every seven years, the human individuality goes through a, a, another, a different phase of development yeah, from birth up to 21. So we go through three broad phases of seven years, approximately seven years each in, at that time. And one very interesting way to look at uh, history is actually to see things in terms of the last uh, 21 centuries, since the time of Christ, for example, from this perspective. Um, and probably we haven't got time to go into the, to detail now on that, but I would definitely recommend your, your viewers to look for themselves at the different um, qualities, characteristics of the different centuries uh, from the time of Christ onwards. Uh, and they will see certain resemblances, particularly if they pay attention to the fourth century, the, um, uh, the, the seventh century, the ninth century, the 14th century yeah? and compare those to the, to the periods of human development when the human being becomes, uh, becomes three uh, and stands up and is you now speaking and says I to himself or herself. And then the point where the human being uh, loses his or her teeth and starts to lose its physical connection to its mother um, a change begins to take place there in the human being's uh, life body or etheric body. And then at puberty, uh, around about 13, 14, 
the, the human being, uh, changes take place there in the astral body and the feeling life of the human beings. Um, and then they begin to really feel the need very strongly to think for themselves yeah, after, after puberty and not to accept authority. Whereas from seven to 14, there is a willingness and a need in fact, to accept a healthy authority on behalf of the growing, tri or the growing child. And if you compare those periods in the, the life of the child with the centuries that have gone by, you come to the, this 21st century, and it's a time when uh, in the 21st century, the, 20, uh, the human being who's 20, 21, um, obviously in most cases leaves home, attempts to establish themselves, take responsibility for their own life in the world. And we as a human race are now, I would say, trying to do just that. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much concern about the environment, for example, uh, at the present time. Um, and, um, and feeling that uh, you know, if, we don't, if, we, if we mess up at this point, then we're in some serious problem. Yeah? Um, by which I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't wish to give the impression I'm in support of the uh, uh, CO2 aspects of, uh, of, of climate change and the, folk, the, the concern on, on the focus on, on carbon dioxide, because I'm not, but certainly with, let's say, the broader picture of concern about the environment, concern about environmental pollution, uh, how the world is going to go on if we continue with our um, materialistic development of our economy, which is based, again, as, as I was saying before, on the particular kind of natural science that we have and its relationship to capitalist uh, economics. Yeah? So these are really huge questions, which are all coming together now in the 21st century. And so we see that within this context, within this background, we see these two huge cultures, which in a sense, the whole world is now um, not exactly caught between, but the whole world is sort of squeezed, shall we say, between America and China. Um, the far west and the far east. And uh, between those two cultures, a culture which, which spans uh, bridges between those two more than most is, of course, Russia. Because in its history, Russia has had a very great deal to do with people from the far east, the Mongols, the Tatars, as well as the people from the west of Europe, as well as the peoples from the south, Muslims, Ottoman Turks, Jews, uh, and then peoples from the north, from uh, Nordic Vikings, you know, who were the original um, leaders of the, the state of the Rus uh, from the ninth century onwards. Yeah. So Russia has a very special part to play, I think, in trying to be, a, a, and of course, it, since the, what, 988, it has been a Christian culture. So it's the Christian culture which has the, a, a very great potential to bridge over the whole world between this, this uh, great span of America and China, just as within Europe itself as a microcosm, the German culture has the capacity, the potential uh, to bridge between say, uh, Britain, the British Isles and Russia. Yeah. Within that smaller micro, within that smaller cultural microcosm of the world, the European microcosm, but Russia plays that part on the world stage, and that's why it's, it's vital that this bridge, this potential bridge, which is also destined to play such a big part in the future, as I was saying before, is not destroyed, is not damaged. Yeah. Um, and that's a very important part of what's going on right now in the in the Ukraine situation, because the the forces of compulsion and coercion, which come either from the far, far uh, west or far east. But at the moment, mostly from the far west, because it's the, the far west, the English speaking uh, culture of America that really has its foot on the the, the accelerator pedal of history, if you will. Yeah? Um, and so that's where the drive is coming from. And the East is to a large significant part reacting to that, reacting to it. Um, and this is why uh, we see this conflict going on in, in Ukraine at the present time. And um, 
Steiner in the First World War, during the First World War, gave a, a number of key lectures, which I would recommend to your, to your viewers, which were given the title, The Karma of Untruthfulness. 25 lectures he gave in the winter of 1916 to 1917. And um, The Karma of Untruthfulness, 25 lectures. He goes deeply into the background of the First World War, the historical uh, background to it, going back many centuries often, but also looking very closely at particular details of what was going on right at that time, and even before the war began. You know, so it, it looks at the big picture and it looks at the, at the details. Very helpful to understand the history of the 20th century. But I just like to focus on this word untruthfulness. And the, the karma of untruthfulness, meaning the consequences of untruthfulness. And I think this is something which we're all definitely reckoning uh, or having to reckon with at the present time, yeah? with the way that propaganda and lies and deception and imbalance of information is being used within the present context of the, of the Ukraine war. The way in which, for example, in the West, we're not given uh, by the mainstream media uh, the picture, as you know, is completely one-sided. You mentioned it to yourself. You mentioned it yourself before. Putin is is seen as the the evil ogre, and Zelensky and the Ukrainians are seen as the uh, the white knights, as it were. Yeah? Or we we as English speaking people have to be very careful because deep down within our culture is the mythological figure, of course, of Saint George and the Dragon, and that's been with us for a long time. Or, or the idea of the bully uh, in the playground, the, the, the bully who is unfairly beating up the little guy. Yeah? St. George rescues the princess from the dragon. These things are, are deep within English speaking culture. And so the media often try to represent the conflicts which the West gets into, or the West intervenes into, in this kind of context, that you have a bad guy, a particular bully, whether it's Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, or, or uh, Osama bin Laden, whoever it is, a, a particular individual often, um, who is represented as the dragon, the bully, and who is beating up some poor victim. Yeah? And then we have to come in as St. George and, and rescue them. And you see this, this sort of image or message repeated again and again, in, uh, in Western media, and it's a fundamentally untrue one, because Steiner pointed out that the power circles of the West have great insight into the, the, the way history unfolds. They have great insight into the, the characteristics of certain peoples and ethnicities, and they use those for their own purposes. Yeah? So this can result in tremendous untruthfulness, and I think we're seeing that at the moment. I mean, the way, for example, uh, Zelensky is in Ukraine, he's surrounded by people in his government who, like him, come from a media background. So they're skilled. He and, the, and his, his uh, close advisors, they're skilled in the presentation of image. Yeah? In the way that the, the Russians, it seems to me, are not. I mean, the, the Ukrainians have been running rings around the, the Ukrainians in, in the media struggle, uh, even though they're not doing so very well on the on the battlefield, as it were. But they are they're doing very well in the media campaign. Yeah? And yeah, sorry, this again, sorry, Terry. So that yeah, the, sorry, the Ukrainians are doing well in the media campaign, but the Russians are not. OK, right. Right. Um, and of <laughs> course, the, the Western media are helping the, the Ukrainian media in that sense. Yeah. Um, we know that, that uh, the Ukrainian media are being given assistance from various um, uh, uh, media organizations in the West. I mean, I remember UK Column recently uh, discussed this question. Um, so this, this theme of, of the consequences of untruthfulness, propaganda, the use of propaganda and, and publicity is, is playing a crucial role in this war. Yeah. And particularly because in the West, we don't have actually a great deal of knowledge uh, about the history of Eastern Europe. Most people in the West haven't even had much to do with, with Eastern Europe in the past thousand years. It's mostly been to, in Britain, for example, it's been Spain, Spain, France and Germany, largely that we've had our struggles with and we, we feel more familiar with, so to speak. But countries like Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, 
uh, Russia uh, to, a to, to, to a lesser extent. We've had something to do with Russia, of course, but um, with these Eastern European countries, many people feel very uh, apart from them still. And when they were behind the Iron Curtain almost, also, we, we, didn't, we, we felt that they were very much over there. We didn't know them so well. So now in this present conflict, the media are able to uh, use that um, ignorance or lack of knowledge of uh, people in uh, Britain and the Western countries to their advantage. Um, and so we have to try and educate ourselves about the background to this struggle, yeah? And the background to Anglo-Russian relationships over the past 200 years, for example, in order to set this conflict within a particular, uh, within a particular historical uh, context. Okay, so if you're talking about the um, karma of untruthfulness, then you know that's that's something that you know karma is something that that occurs in the future related to the past, as it were. So you know when Steiner wrote uh, or gave those lectures, and they're entitled "The Karma of Untruthfulness," he's talking about the First World War, yeah. and that being the consequences of the untruthfulness that that went on before, presumably. Is, is that right? So yeah. w what we're experiencing now is, you know, constant untruthfulness. If you look at the last couple of years, the way the media handled the whole COVID thing. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't bode well for the future, essentially, does it, if we're living through um, it? Unfortunately, it doesn't bode well for the future. I mean, that's quite right. Um, and this is a very big, <laughs> a very big problem and question for us, because obviously it's understandable that people are looking for hope they're looking for a way through but we have to reckon with the fact that uh, as we can see from the past too there were periods of tremendous difficulty for humanity or for particular races or groups within humanity cultures and that those cultures had to live through those periods those difficult periods and particular generations had to live through those periods. You remember what I said earlier about a certain generation. You can talk about a generational karma, do you see? That the generation can be born and come into the stream of history, which in a previous epoch may also have had uh, uh, perhaps the, the, the destiny to live at a difficult time. Yeah? And so you, you have generations who... Who, are, who live their lives at a time when a culture is rising. Another generation will live its life as a time when the culture is at its peak of flourishing, and another at a time of decline, and another at a time of collapse, complete collapse, and even total disintegration. Yeah? And unfortunately, there are certain generations who have to live through those, uh, through those times. The positive we can take from that, of course, is that a materialist cannot take from that is that it's not the end of the story for us as individuals because we go on into future lives. You know, th this one life of 70, 80 years, 90 years is not the end. So we go on and we live future lives. Yeah? Um, but it is the case that a generation, for example, will have very, very great difficulties. And Steiner pointed out that, you know, that at the time of the First World War and in those years just after the First World War, he died in 1925, um, that if certain things were not achieved, either in his time or in the generation after his time, let's say by 1950, for example, then humanity would be in grave, grave difficulties. And then he, he also said that, you know, that... He specifically mentioned the year 2000 and said that if certain things were not done, if humanity, for example, had not found a way to work consciously with the angels, with the angelic realm by the year 2000, then again, we were heading into really serious difficulties in our culture. Uh, and that, that humanity would, would either stand you know, at, at the grave of civilization or it would stand at that point where the, um, the, the, the struggle led by the Archangel Michael would be fought through to victory. And that's a very stark uh, choice. You're either standing at the grave of civilization, which means, I guess, that you're not quite dead yet, but you're almost dead. 
You know, if you're standing at the grave, you're obviously not in the grave, right? But uh, you, you may be just about to be put in the grave, so to speak. Yeah? So the situation is extremely grim. Or you're at that key point where you can effect a turnaround and uh, begin the struggle, um, which will obviously not necessarily be a, a short struggle. It could be a long struggle, but it will lead to ultimate victory. And the key to that is again to understanding what period we are living in. What are the forces that are actually working within our epoch and then within our smaller epoch? For example, I just mentioned now Archangel Michael. Within those larger periods I've mentioned, 2,160 years, you have seven. Um, well, it's actually not, well, there are seven archangelic periods as well. And these are approximately 350 years. Yeah? So you don't get seven of those fitting within exactly 2,160 years. There's a slight overlap. It's about five, five or so angel archangelic periods. But these archangelic periods relate, as I said before, to specific cultures, peoples. So that within one of those periods, 350 years or so, you see one of these these cultures, which is under the supervision of an archangel, coming forward with a major impulse, which serves the 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 the, um, the larger impulses of the of the of the time spirits who are responsible for the two thousand one hundred and sixty years. So, if we give you an example of that, um, we see how, for example, we have Henry the Eighth in England, fifteen oh nine, he becomes the king, um, and that's where the Royal Navy really starts in effect, you know, the, British, the British Royal Navy. And then when you see with the Tudors, Elizabeth I, we see, and Shakespeare, uh, you see the English start to set, set out onto the oceans, and then gradually, and then comes the East India Company, and then comes the Industrial Revolution, and, and, and. Yeah? So by the time we get to Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria dies in 1901, then that whole period there that I've just described is the rise and rise and rise of the British Empire. So this little island here and its rise to power takes place almost exactly within what's called the age of Gabriel, who is the archangel for that period, um, for that smaller period of history. So within the age of Gabriel time, the English culture, uh, and then the British culture which starts in England, the British culture comes to the fore. And by 1879, which is when the age of Gabriel uh, finishes, then the English culture you see, or the British culture is already starting, at least in outer terms of outer power, is already starting to decline. So the last couple of decades of Queen Victoria's reign, although the British Empire is still very large, obviously, and after the First World War, it will actually come to its maximum. But the inner impulse, the inner energy is already starting to decline. Yeah. So within that archangelic period from Henry VIII to Queen Victoria, that is the period of England. And then it's taken over by the USA, another um, uh, English speaking culture. Yeah. So. Um, you have these archangelic periods within these larger periods. And we have to try to understand how these different rhythms and cycles and impulses work together in order to make sense of where we are at the moment and, and, and what's happening. And because, as Steiner said, this karma of untruthfulness, unfortunately, in the 20th century, the, the forces of, of opposition to humanity's development were working so effectively um, that they they did succeed in setting us back a great deal, yeah, and, and so we didn't make the progress, which obviously I think Rudolf Steiner would have was was hoping that we would make, either by the 1950s or by the end of the millennium, uh, by the year 2000. Yeah, so we are in fact make heading into a period where we're going to be suffering the karma of untruthfulness. Yeah because we haven't seen through the, the lies and the deceptions which made so much of the history of the last 120 years, whether we're talking about capitalism or communism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we are heading into a potentially very, very difficult period. And we have to summon up 
our forces of uh, courage, uh, but also insight to try to understand this. And keep in mind that no human culture, humanity as a whole, has totally collapsed uh, since, um, well, I think we, we have to look back to uh, how one understands the fall of Atlantis to see the complete collapse of, of humanity, for example. Um, but there hasn't been such an event since then. Certain cultures have collapsed, but there hasn't been a complete collapse of the whole of humanity. Uh, and in this sense, the, the, what we are looking to in the 21st century, I would say, um, can give us a bit of hope that we are growing the, the forces of individualism and uh, of, of, a, of a more positive individualism that can see through what's going on and can see through the lies and the deceptions. And we both know that over COVID, for example, around the world, many, many people have, uh, have done that, yeah? have been able to see through this. And more and more people are waking up all the time. Yeah? So things are going to get very difficult over the next 30, 40 years, no question. But um, at the same time, I think there are at least grounds for hope that there will be people who will, who will get beyond this yeah? and will come out the other side. But how many of us, as it were, or which cultures will come through the other side is a, is a, a very difficult question. Yes, well, um, I'm very glad that you painted a, a little bit of positivity into the picture there because so many people do feel um, that it's rather bleak at the moment and that it's going yeah. to get more and more bleak. And in one sense, I mean, we have to reckon with the fact that that's probably true. But yeah. then also to even just a very simple fact to come back to that we are spiritual beings yeah. and yeah. The, the difficulties, no matter what difficulties we must live through on the physical plane, that's yeah. not the end of the story. <clears throat> Absolutely. And it, yeah. it's, it's been fascinating for me uh, as an Australian watching what's been happening back there from a mm, distance because mm. the, the government took a very, very hard line yeah. with COVID, but the, the, there's been a massive move against it. I'm not sure if you're aware of yes. that, but yeah. there's a guy yeah. by the name of um, Michael Gray Griffiths who started the protest movement essentially with a few other people. And he's now actually travelling the country, has been ever since, basically you know he can't work he yeah. can't do anything without the yeah. um without having the jabberwocky so yeah. you know and he's going around the country interviewing all these people and what's really interesting is you know a lot of a lot of them are lost lost their jobs they're essentially refugees in their own country some of them um went from western australia to the other coast for the protests and couldn't get back into their own state yeah yeah let, yeah. let alone back into their own businesses and yes. jobs yeah and what's really interesting is that almost every one of them says something about spirituality, something about yes. uh, an awakening. <clears throat> yeah. I think maybe I'd, I'd like to ask you about this as well. I think there's a little bit of a danger in this uh, speaking about this spiritual awakening that's taking place, mm -hmm. which can become a little bit divorced from the earthly world a little bit um, mm -hmm. uh, disappearing, a kind of a spirituality that wants us to kind of disappear into the clouds. Yeah. Um, but my hope is that it, it does find a balance. But what are your thoughts about that, Terry, that people talk no, about I, awakening, awakening, awakening all the time? But I couldn't agree more. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Mick, because I think you can see that this is coming from, in a way, from, from two directions although they have something in common. And that is, as you've just said, it's a kind of, uh, it's essentially what it is, is a desire to um, almost not to be here in a certain sense on the physical earth. And you, that those people who have that drive have, have been in, there've been such people for a long, long time, thousands of years. Yeah? Uh, there are people who have a very strong drive to be in the physical earth, and there are others who actually would wish to withdraw as soon as possible. And I can see two directions here. You, you've got, for example, those within a, a Christian context, a Christian fundamentalist context, whose fundamentalist understanding of the, uh, of the New Testament and the book of Revelation, for example, um, tells them that we're about to hit the rapture and, and they're about to leave the planet in effect. And the end of the earth is coming. We're living in the end times. And, and they inter interpret history 
very strictly according to uh, their understanding of what the end times are. And we know that those people have been with us again, really, since the Protestant Reformation. And um, for every, every generation almost since the Protestant Reformation, you've had people interpreting the, the Bible in such a way as to say, well, uh, the last judgment is almost upon us and the end times are here. Yeah? Um, and before the end times happen, there has to be disaster. The Antichrist has to come, the, 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 the terror has to come, the, if you will, the new world order has to come what, by whatever terms they used it, that they called it by then. Yeah? Um, and, and then after this, this new world emperor or Antichrist or new world order, then the end of the world will come. Yeah? So that's, that picture is still there, very strong, I would say particularly in, in America, but not only there. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got the, the New Ages and the New Age uh, movement people who also have a certain, as you were saying, that everything is heading in the direction of a spiritual awakening and, and channeling from various groups, whether it's being, you know, the Galactic Federation or the, or, or, or the people from uh, you know, Alpha Centauri or, or, or wherever it is, or the Nine or the uh, all kinds of channeling impl impulses going on. And people feeling that we are on the verge of this spiritual breakthrough and everything in pretty soon is going to be wonderful. We just have to hang together for a few more years and get through this. And then all of a sudden there's going to be this incredible, uh, yeah, incredible breakthrough is going to happen. I, I don't see that happening. Um, I, I see that the situation is going to get a lot worse before it, it, it gets better. Um, and, and I don't reckon we have time necessarily in this podcast to go into why exactly it's going to get a lot worse within the next 10, 20 years. But uh, I think it is. And we have to go through that. We have to come out the other end. Yeah? Um, and even after we've come out through the other end, it's not all going to be fine and dandy. It just means that the, the, the potentially uh, most intense moments, it will have been behind us. Yeah? Um, but we will then have to struggle to, to plant the seeds that Rudolf Steiner already tried to plant at, at the end of the First World War when he spoke about the threefold social organism. So a new way to uh, build community, build society, build economy, um, a new culture in, in, in a new uh, modern Christian threefold way. Yeah? Um, so that's the, the prospect for the future. But before that, we have to get through this crisis which is coming at us in the 2030s. And I think this is why we can see that the forces of uh, opposition to our development and progress are so much focused, these elite forces, whether it be the World Economic, uh, uh, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, or or whether it be the UN or, or the WHO, or whether it be the, the Saudis, the, they've got their own 2030 program. Everybody's focused on 2030 and the 2030s, which of course is 2000 years after the uh, incarnation, resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection of uh, Christ in Jesus. Yeah. So that's what's coming up in 2030, 2033. And so this is why these elite forces are all focused on that, this, this period of time. So this has to be gone through. Um, and um, I think this, you know, this is what the, 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 the real crisis which uh, Steiner had a sense for that was approaching us and why this period around the millennium, these early decades of the new millennium after 2000 was so, so important. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, it's quite a remarkable, quite a remarkable time in history. And especially that we are, we, we have these two cultures of America and, and China, a bit like Scylla and Charybdis on, on either side of us, you know, that we have to somehow, that the rest of humanity has to sort of try and get through without, um, without yeah, descending into nuclear war between these two, for example. Okay, yes. Yeah, and it's like we have these, um, these two forces. So there's one we spoke about this, feeling there's a, that there's a spiritual awakening happening you know we just got to hold on for a little while everything's going to be perfect yeah um, and then there's this the other side which you've just described the sort of um the world economic forum impulse which is really more about fettering us to the earth you could say maybe you know yeah. they're talking about merging us with technology and you know yeah. you, 
I just saw a clip last night. Uh, someone from the World Economic Forum said that in you know 10, 20 years, you won't have a phone anymore. The phone will be built into your wrist, you know, exactly. things like that. So mm -hmm. this merging mm -hmm. with merging with matter, forgetting about the spirit. Yeah. Um, and so what what do you think in terms of what the individual can do? And I mean, I, I don't mean what can the individual individual do to make this all go away and so that it's all solved, because that, that ain't right. gonna happen. But right. what can we do as individuals? You know, Steiner mentioned, um, I read a quote a few days ago where he'd said something like, the person who takes up seriously meditation in, in mm -hmm. the anthroposophical sense, this mm -hmm. is holding mm -hmm. the balance between opposites mm -hmm. and yeah. the ability to stand on one's own two feet and also, yeah. you know, open to the spiritual world but remain grounded. Um, yeah. yeah, what do you think we can do as individuals to you know, survive to maybe even thrive or to, you know, and to develop ourselves, but also build this community, commu new sense of community, or at least plant the seeds for it. Right. Um, well, in those, uh, those lectures I mentioned before, the, the 25 lectures called the karma of untruthfulness, you know, the, 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 if I just give a little picture of how those came about, that he was building this uh, remarkable uh, building in Switzerland at that time, the Goethe Arnhem building. And there were people from many, many different countries working on this with him, um, who were living there and trying to build this building. And they were, they included people who were on opposite sides, as it were, whose countries, they came from countries that were fighting each other, like uh, Russians and Germans or English and Germans and French and Germans and so on. Yeah? Um, and as you might suspect, I mean, they were not all, uh, spiritual enlightened people by any means they were just trying to go to walk the path of spirituality but they still suffered in their souls because they were not yet free from emotional uh for example nationalisms or chauvinism they were trying to overcome that but they hadn't yet completely overcome it so they got into arguments with each other who's responsible for the war etc um and these tensions grew to the point where eventually they said uh to, they turned to Rudolf Stein and said, could you please help us to understand, you know, what is, what's going on within this war? What can we do as individuals to respond to this terrible situation in which we find ourselves? And it was at that time, 1915, 16, um, one of the worst times in, for, for centuries in, in modern history, and with, certainly within Europe. So I was always struck by his answer to that was, well, one of the most important things that you can do is to make the effort to see through what is going on, to truly understand what is going on at the present time. Yeah. Now, meditation, you mentioned meditation. Meditation, of course, is something we can do and should do at all times in history, whether you're living in a flourishing period, a declining period or whatever kind of period of history you're living in. Yeah. Anybody who's meditating is contributing to the to spiritual growth within the planet of humanity within the planet. So that's something we are, and anybody obviously who's on the spiritual path can also always be doing. But the effort to, to, to really understand what's going on is, is crucial. And therefore, you can see that even within the spiritual, scientific, the anthroposophical movement, unfortunately, there are people who do not make the effort to look into the background to current events. They, or they, they might feel it's too dark. I don't want to go there. I don't want to look there. It will make me depressed. It will make me miserable and so on and so forth. Yeah? Steiner's point was, no, we, you can't afford that kind of self-indulgence, frankly. You have to go, you've got to look, you know, look right into it and you've got to really make the effort to understand what's going on. And that's why I think make that those those lectures in which for me they're, they're really a key you know they they're almost like um uh it might sound a bit trivializing but they're like almost like an applied media course even though in those days the media was only obviously print media yeah for the most part when there was no radio yet as such broadcasting and so on but it's print media books magazines journals etc but he really takes you through so many of the aspects which we are now through, those of us who, who have been awakened um, uh, to what's going on at the present time, and, have, and many people, have, have, that's happened to them through using the internet, one has to say, 
um, because suddenly they're exposed to a lot more information than was they could have got, say, 30 years ago. Um, so in that sense, that people can really begin to see through what is actually going on today. Yeah? Um, but the, the danger is that, of course, you can get you can get sidetracked, you can get distracted from, from many of the forces that are operative in, in the internet. And that's why it's so important to have a spiritual background of the kind uh, that, that Steiner was able to, to provide, that, that one, can, one can find with spiritual science in terms of these wider pictures of history, yeah? whether it's through, as I said, individual reincarnations, or whether it's through these, these activities of these broader and more powerful spiritual beings. So that's really important. And the last point I would make about what we can do individually for the future, and that is that, you know, even often spiritual uh, people who are on a spiritual path, when they come together and they uh, try to, in their small ways, build community, there are, um, it's often difficult because there are four simple things which people don't necessarily manage to do in, in communities. And when I say community, it can even be a small group of say a dozen people or half a dozen people who get together to discuss something. And those four simple things are to speak loudly enough and clearly enough to have care about the way you enunciate and speak so that the people who are deaf or who are old cannot under can understand properly what you are saying. So loud and clear speech. Secondly, to speak in such a way that you follow on from what other people are saying. And so that as a group together, you build up an organism of conversation and you're not just in a self-centered way, jumping in with your own point, points, irrespective of what other people have said. Thirdly, that you uh, express your views, obviously without becoming violent, uh, antipathetic, emotional, and, and so forth. And so that's the, the that's what you might call the astral level, the control of your emotions. And then fourthly, is to 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 as far as possible to come to the point, to be succinct, to make your point, and not to ramble, because sometimes people can ramble on and on and on and on without actually going towards a particular point. Yeah. So the, those four simple things alone would, I think, improve if people really worked at them in whatever group in a disciplined way, they would really um, contribute to improving the, the real social qualities of life of any organization. But you, you sometimes find that isn't the case. So that's something for the future, I think, that we can all do at any time, uh, like with meditation, which we can also do individually. This is something which one could do socially, these four uh, exercises. That's great. That's really brought it right down into the here and now something we can do as well. And maybe we could add to that um, the ability to listen and the, yeah, the, or the, tra the, the training in listening, which sort of yeah, goes without saying. Steiner, yeah. Steiner spoke in various places about actually the transformative power of someone who actually really listens, puts, or in a sense, puts them their own opinions and thoughts and beliefs aside for a second, just, just for a little while, they'll still be there at the end, but um, how that can be transformative. And I've seen that in, in my own work with um, yeah. counselling and spiritual development, coaching. Yeah, absolutely, 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 Mick. Yeah, I mean, that, that in a way is, I would say, connected with the second aspect, you know, where you, you're, you're aware of how the conversation is moving within a group of people, right? So, so you, you try to, to listen in such a way that you can make a contribution into the conversation that builds on what others have said. Yeah. So it doesn't become a haphazard mess of a conversation. It's going all over the place, uh, but rather is building and growing or, or organically. And when you have such a conversation with a group of people, I'm sure you've had this experience too. You feel at the end of it, wow, that was something that really, that was something really quite profound. Yeah that the group of us together, we, we, we built our thoughts together in such a way that it, it came to a really good place. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. And that, it, in, in a sense, that is actually community building, isn't it? That's yeah. it there and then. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. 
Okay, Terry, well, I think that's a good place to finish up. So mm. I just want to say a big thank you. It's uh, it's actually been a dream of mine. I think I've contacted you maybe three years ago to have a conversation and we didn't quite, I didn't get around to make it happen, but it's finally happened. So I'm very, very happy about that. I've got a million other things I could talk to you about for hours and hours, but I, <laughs> I think what we got to today was really, was really great. And sure. um, what I'd like to do is just to be able to promote your work a little bit. So um, people can find you at uh, threeman.org is your website, and that's the word. So it's T H R E E M A N.org. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And that'll be in the show description as well. So people can find that. I'll also put in some links to Terry's books yeah. and where you can buy them, and also links to the Present Age magazine, which Terry is the editor of and writes articles for. And also no, the like court. A joint editor. It's not sorry, joint editor. Yeah. I'm joint editor. I'm not doing the, all of it myself, okay. but I, I'm one yeah. of the editors. Yeah. That's along with um, what's the other person's name, Terry? Uh, Oshoya Jurfi. Okay, I won't try and pronounce that, but <laughs> okay, good. Hungarian, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, and it's a great magazine. I get that myself, and also the quarterly magazine that Terry often writes an article in uh, is called New View, and that's also. I mean, I I get that. Make sure I read that every every quarter so thanks very much for your time terry i'll hit stop on the record and uh look forward to speaking to you again if you're up for doing this again sometime i'd really really yeah like sure to it's been a pleasure thank you very much for asking me thank you you're very welcome thanks terry cheers bye-bye bye-bye thanks very much for listening to the spiritual scientist podcast if you'd like to support the show you can make a one-time donation via paypal or if you'd like to become a member you can make a recurring donation via subscribe star the podcast can be found on all good podcast platforms like apple spotify and google and the video format can be found on odyssey rumble bitshoot brighteon and youtube thanks very much for watching bye for now